The basis for our sermon this morning is taken from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 15 to 21. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Our Savior Jesus, on the night before he died, looked into his friends' faces, and there he saw fear in their eyes. He saw confusion plastered all over their faces, because this night was unlike any other night that the disciples had experienced with their teacher and Savior. He had started off the night in the upper room with them and had told them a truth that they still were very much confounded by that one of them was going to betray him that night. And even after Jesus had said, the one who dips his hand into this bowl with me will be the one that betrays me, and Judas did so and then left, the disciples still couldn't grasp in their minds how one of their fellow brothers in the ministry could be the traitor. They could not even grasp for themselves what Judas had already done, sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. After all, some of them had gone out into the mission field with him. He was the one that they had entrusted with all of their finances and all of the things that people had donated for the benefit of the ministry of Jesus and the proclamation of the gospel. They just couldn't get it, but that lingered in the back of their minds. Some one of you tonight is going to betray me. And then after Judas left, Jesus had the Passover meal with them. But it wasn't an ordinary Passover meal like they'd ever had before. Now Jesus was instituting a new command for them, a new celebration that the bread and wine that they received was now his body and blood that he would give into death on the cross for them. Even though he had told them time and time again, the Son of Man must be handed over and put to death and rise again, when he was saying it this evening in celebration of the Passover meal, they were wondering to themselves, what does he mean he's going to be crucified? And then he told them, I won't eat and drink of this again until I do so with you in the Father's kingdom. That meant he was going away, he was leaving. He had been with them for three years. They had watched him teach and preach. They had taken into their souls the life-giving waters of his word that had comforted them and assured them that he had come to rescue not only them but the entire world from sin and from death. They didn't know exactly how that would happen, but they still did trust in him. And now, now he was saying he was not going to be with them. They just didn't want to hear it and it made them extremely uncomfortable. And on top of it, they had watched as he did miracle after miracle. He always knew just the right thing to do. He always knew just the right thing to say to strike at people's hearts and preach the truth. And now what were they going to do if he was going away? How could they manage on their own? They would have to muddle through things and always be asking themselves, what do we say, what do we do? Or at least they were afraid that night as they looked into the future. For those reasons, and I'm sure many more. And as Jesus then continues to comfort them just before our text for today, he tells them, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Because I'm going to my father's house and I'm preparing a place for you. Thomas asked him, how do we know this place to where you're going? And Jesus ended up telling him, you know the way because I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. And he seems to question at first Thomas's faith, but immediately in the next verse he says, but Thomas and all of you, you do know me. You do know the place where I'm going. You do know the way it's through the Father and through me. And so now as Jesus is speaking to them, he's not questioning their faith. He's not questioning their trust in him. But now he's going to share with them some general statements, some directions for their future that is coming up when he is not with them in flesh and blood that they can see. 
He gives them directions for the future as they will go out into the world once he ascends into heaven and pours out the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And also he gives them great comfort to lift up their hearts in the face of overwhelming odds as they go out into a world that did not believe in Jesus and did not see the Holy Spirit as God himself. And so Jesus says to them, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. When we think about Jesus commanding us on what to do, we often think about those Ten Commandments, and absolutely that's true. And Jesus is including every single one of the commands that God has given us on the pages of Scripture. He's really telling the disciples, but also he's telling us today, because you love me, if you love me, and the disciples are saying, I do, I do, and in your minds you're saying, I do, I do, okay, now keep my commands. This is how you demonstrate your love for me in the world. Follow everything that I have established for your good. The will that I have and instruction that I include on the pages of Scripture is to light your way and your path. It's to guide you along and give you everything you need. When you go out into the world, he was telling his disciples, you don't have to rack your brains with what to share and what to speak. As you follow my commands, as you are that light that shows itself to the world, that city on a hill that is not hidden, you will glorify your Father in heaven, but also it will lead others to ask you why you believe what you believe and what you believe. And so as you preach that gospel message, as you not only follow my commands that I've given you, but also you follow the command to preach my word, know what's going to happen. I will give you the truth to speak. Some will believe and others not, but know that I am with you. You might feel that you are alone as you go up against the vast armies of unbelief and wickedness that the devil has mounted against you, but you do not go out into the world defenseless or powerless because I, your Savior, will give you somebody to be with you. And he promises the Holy Spirit. But what did Jesus mean when he promised the Holy Spirit? Did that mean that Old Testament believers didn't have the Spirit in their heart? No. Even King David admits in Psalm 51 that he had the Spirit of God. And he even asks after he falls into sin and repents of it, he says, Lord, do not send your Spirit from me. The Old Testament believers had the Spirit of God. But Jesus was promising the disciples something much more. He was promising them in the New Testament age a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would descend on the church at Pentecost and would remain in the hearts of Christians until the end of time when Jesus comes again. In a way, in the Old Testament, we see this kind of teaching where Elisha asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, thinking of the Holy Spirit that emboldened the hearts of Old Testament prophets. Well, now in the New Testament age, God says through Jesus, I'm about to pour this out on you disciples, And for us here today, that means Jesus also promises it to us as well. But make no mistake, Jesus, because we love him, asks us the same thing today in our day and age. Because you love me, if you love me, and I do, keep my commands. He doesn't say pick and choose what you want my commands to be. Pick and choose what you teach and preach based upon what's most culturally relevant and popular at the time. Preach and teach only the things that will bring people into your church and don't preach and teach the things that will drive people away. No, he asks his disciples to keep all of his commands and that also means preaching to tell others to keep all of his commands. Now, is that a popular thing in our day and age? The obvious answer is no, it's not. We can think of any number of commands that God gives that right now are being fought against in culture. I don't even need to tell you what those things are. But here's something that is finding its way into the hearts of Christians more and more because we see it out in the world. We confuse God's love and his forgiveness with something that the world says acceptance and tolerance of wickedness. Many churches start to teach things like, if Jesus is so loving and he he cares for all people and we are meant to be a place that invites sinners to come in, well, surely that means that we shouldn't tell people that they're bad people by nature. 
We shouldn't point out and expose the sin in people's lives. That's negative. That's part of the, the Old Testament. That's about an old kind of God that's angry and unloving. But we have a different God in Jesus in the New Testament. And Jesus really would be saying, absolutely not. He proclaims it in his word across all space and time that if you love me, you will be preaching and teaching to obey my commands. He says the same thing in the book of 1 John. This is love for God. To obey his commands. And for the Christian, in our new man that exists inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, these commands are not burdensome. But now what Jesus also asks as a command, because you love him and because I love him, is to tell people this as well. It's to do the hard work with our friends and family and coworkers and neighbors of sharing with them both the truth that we are sinners that need a savior, sinners who need to repent, and now people that have been washed by the blood of Jesus, but being washed by the blood of Jesus, now are asked to turn from the sins in every single one of our lives. And that means the sins of everyone else too. When you think about the task that you as an individual Christian are called to share this truth with other people, if you love me, keep my commands, how does that make you feel? Very often for us in the church who by his grace see what the word of God says, we feel anxious, we feel worried. Maybe we even think to ourselves, but I've sinned in so many ways, so how could I possibly tell other people how God wants them to live in life. Or we give in to fear because we look at the culture around us and we only see the fearful stories that are plastered on the news screen or plastered on our, our news feeds on our phones and we say, oh my goodness, how dark and terrible and sinful the world is getting. The end times are near. And that's true. The Bible says the end times are the entire New Testament age. They are near and we will see the love of most grow cold as Jesus says. But Jesus doesn't want us to give in to fear when we think about the message that we need to proclaim. Nor does he want us to compromise the truth. Because if we end up compromising the truth of what he says, we are not serving God himself. We are serving the devil. And the idea that God's forgiveness is actually equivalent to his tolerance and acceptance of sin is one of the most damning and destructive teachings that the world could ever know. It's really also what the devil said to Eve in the garden when he was tempting her to eat the fruit, you will not surely die. It's the same thing being proclaimed today by many Christians and many churches. And again, when I say that, it's not to say, look how terrible they are and how good we are. No, but that this temptation can come into our hearts too with our loved ones and family members. Because we can be blindsided and confused like those disciples. When our loved ones, when our family members leave the faith and they reject God's word, and they say no to his commands, even though they know the truth. And when they do that over and over and over, they reject his will for their life and demonstrate that they are no longer God's children, but they for the time being are outside of God's family. And our hearts weep at that and know that if they do not repent and do not change, they will not enjoy the glories of heaven with us. And so how can we not then want to reach out and speak to them and tell them that what they are doing is hurting their souls both now and eternally. As you might look ahead to that task that you have this week, this month, this year, as you look at those people around you, your friends and family that have turned from Jesus and do not know him, it's easy to be swallowed up by that fear or by that desire to just not rock the boat and be complacent and compromise. But Jesus lifts our hearts and focuses our eyes back on him and says, I know that this is coming. He even told his disciples on this night as he was speaking to them, you will be cast out of the synagogue. You will be beaten and killed. People will think they are doing God a service when they do these things to you. But don't worry ahead of time what you're going to say because I will give you the spirit who will give you the words to speak. And do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid because I have overcome the world. My peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We see this in our text too then. As Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. 
one of the most painful pictures we can see or maybe video clips that we can see online is during times of war when maybe a, a, a group of people has been killed and there's just a child left running around. The warfare has left the land scorched around them and you see just a young orphan child crying. That is the picture that we have of ourselves in the world and that we think of ourselves so often. Lord Jesus, I'm in this scorched land. Lord Jesus, I'm in this warfare um, that's battling for souls, for my loved ones and family members, proclaiming the truth. I love you. I want to keep your commands and teach others to do the same. But Lord Jesus, I feel so alone. I feel like I'm the only one and I feel like the devil is going to win. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I don't leave you as orphans. I remember hearing a story about a GI soldier in the Vietnam War who found a young girl that was an orphan and he made sure that until he was shipped back to the States, he took care of her. And years later, they met and they just wept because he had saved her life. More than just a GI saving our life, we have a father who found us orphaned, who found us kicking in our own blood and just abandoned. And he brought us into his home and sheltered us with his love. He washed us by the blood of his son that he gave in exchange for us and our lives. And through the waters of baptism that we heard about in our second lesson for today, he says that he has washed our souls clean. He has given us the pledge of a clear conscience. And he has saved us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When Jesus says in this text, Because I live, you also will live. He's talking about seeing Jesus by faith and the life, the eternal life that is now ours by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, is poured out on us generously by Jesus in this New Testament age. And God assures us, I have not left you, but I have adopted you as my very own. And if I purchased you with my own flesh and blood, if I rose from the dead to assure you that death has been defeated, will I not also be with you as you go out into the world? As you step out onto the battlefield, you no longer do so as an orphan. No, you are my child and I never give up on my children. I will protect you and keep you safe. I will guide you and counsel you and instruct you. I will give you hope and a future because I'm sending you the advocate. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit, God himself, to live inside of you. That should be a very humbling but awful message for us to just help us to marvel all the more at God's love, that the infinite God who stretches beyond the vast borders of the universe, the one who created all things, the one who brought you into being and gave you all your skills and talents, the one who put you here and put you now here in this word is the one that chooses to now dwell in your hearts by faith. And where he has taken up residence, he will not so easily vacate it. We're told in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8 that we will encounter persecution. But what does Paul say at the very end of Romans 8? But even despite all this persecution, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's the same message as we hear here. The Holy Spirit is poured out onto us and we are no longer orphans. So when you go out into the world, when you live your day-to-day life with those friends and family members that don't know Jesus, when you come into contact with people who have questions about what you believe and why you believe it, never hesitate. Never hesitate to share with them the peace and comfort that you know you have in the Holy Spirit who has put Jesus in your hearts to live and rule there and who has connected you to eternal life. Because Jesus lives, you also will live. Because Jesus is one with the Father and Jesus is one with you, you are now also one with God. Give thanks to him for it. Treasure that truth that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. And when you go out into the world and it seems as if everything is stacked against you, remember that the victory belongs to the Lord. The battle is already won. And Jesus goes before us and behind us and beside us and in us. And he was the one that gave himself for us. He will never abandon us. He does not leave us as orphans, but gives us the advocate, so we are one with God forever. Amen.